These two films, The Message of the Tibetans, parts one and two, were shot in 1964 and 1965. Arnaud de wished that the commentaries were translated without attempting to update or modernize them. Thus, they remain as historical documents of the Tibetan world after the Chinese invasion, but before becoming established in the West. Testimony of a world at a moment of great change, but also testimony of that which never changes. has been reduced to forming folk dancing troops in order to maintain old customs. It means that the folklore of bygone days is menaced by extinction. When that nation goes to the extent of opening schools to safeguard traditional dances and timeless music, the source of this art form is running dry. The Tibetans who have taken refuge in India know this well. Since the predictable defeat of the Tibetan people's revolt against Chinese administration and facing the particularly anti-religious measures that followed, some 70,000 Tibetans from different provinces took refuge in Indian territory. None were turned away by the Indian government, which helped them with a sense of urgency, ensuring that they had at least enough to live on. The fate of these refugees is tragic. The conditions under which they escaped, the weeks of walking across the mountains, the fear and the hunger have marked these children, possibly forever. Very often, parents have accepted particularly hard jobs, such as building roads at high altitudes. They are obliged to leave their small children with organizations that can take them into care, like this nursery in Dharamsala, where they are looked after and educated under the supervision of the Dalai Lama's sister. But these children are not just refugees like other involuntary immigrants and people in exile almost anywhere in the world who try to smile again despite their parents being dead, their village destroyed and their freedom lost. These children are also the frail heirs to the Tibetan tradition and to the extraordinary Buddhist wisdom which achieved the celebrity of their country, all the more mysterious since almost unknown.
The pictures you see now, and whose quality is not always perfect, are historical documents that were filmed 15 years ago in Tibet itself by one of the Dalai Lama's assistants, to whom a member of the Indian consulate in Lhasa had lent his camera. Up until 1959, very few Westerners had been able to get right into Tibet itself. The works, written by the experts on Tibet, except perhaps those of the famous French explorer Alexandre David Neal, were hardly read by unspecialized readers. The word Tibet mostly evoked clichés such as the ceremonial costumes, the tall headdresses and the long trumpets used by the monks in Lhasa the isolated monasteries perched on the mountainsides, the long, dangerous rides across the high deserted plateaus, and a great reputation of mystery, magic, and legend. Providing it took place in Tibet, one was willing to believe in the incredible. In this vast country, only two names were widely known to outsiders, Lhasa and its famous Patala, the Dalai Lama's palace, at the same time a seat of government, a fortress, residence, monastery, prison and mausoleum. The Lama's strange rituals and sacred dances were performed there, spectacular and spellbinding. But the Bible says that there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed. Before their knowledge in psychology, mysticism, spirituality and cosmology, and their transcendental wisdom disappear, the Tibetan sages and yogis have agreed to the shooting of these films, revealing their everlasting message. The world is roused when the architectural relics of a civilization that died out thousands of years ago are in danger of becoming lost. And all the newspapers talk about the efforts and the enormous sums of money that have been given to protect the Egyptian temples on the Upper Nile. It seems that we are less concerned by the destruction of a culture before our very eyes. Will something survive of the Tibetan tradition and of this extraordinary tantric Buddhism? For neither the worldwide celebrity of the Tibetan Lamas, as regards yoga, occultism and magic powers, nor the commercial success of a few sensational books, enable these refugees with no resources to support the true spiritual masters who are now settled on the Indian slopes of the Himalayas and in Sikkim, and to rekindle the fire which has dimmed on the high plateaus where it had been burning so brightly for so long. <laughs> Up 
until 1959, the few films and photos which were made mostly in Sikkim or in Darjeeling in India revealed an astonishing world to us. Superficial reports gave the feeling that Tibetans were worshipping a pantheon of divinities with grimacing faces, in whose honour macabre rituals were celebrated that were generally considered as the degeneration of Buddhism. It was difficult for Europeans, for Christian missionaries in particular, to discover the wisdom behind the symbols in these apparently grotesque displays. What is this Lamaism then? since such is the name given by Westerners to the Tibetan religion. Before Buddhism, and then parallel to Buddhism, other types of worship such as witchcraft and shamanism have always existed in Tibet. The principal and oldest of these religions is the Bern, Uban Po. It was to the Bern religion's disadvantage that Buddhism became established in Tibet where it was declared the state religion. Tibetan Buddhism is one thing, Burn is another, and above all witchcraft, yet another. It is important not to confuse them. Like Buddhist Tibetans, some sorcerers and shamans have also fled their country over the last years to find safety in Bhutan or Sikkim. Near Gangtok, a wealthy Sikkimese called in an occultist healer to take care of his ailing wife. He went into a trance and revealed to the wealthy man that it would be necessary to sacrifice a goat in exchange for his wife's life. The headdress and the instruments used by these sorcerers look like those used by some of the Buddhists who belong to the Red Hat Order. Observers in too much of a hurry have easily been mistaken, and naturally the Tibetan Buddhists don't appreciate this kind of confusion. Sikkim also, this elderly Tibetan woman is an oracle. At times, not always, she too goes into a trance, and while she is thus taken over, she can predict the near future of those who come to consult her. This young girl here finds out from her today what she can expect in the coming months, and receives advice concerning the attitude she should thereby adopt. Furthermore, the official Buddhist church also acknowledges oracles, whether men or women. But their recognition and the demand for their services undergo extremely strict control and regulation. More or less driven out of Tibet itself, witchcraft, and particularly animal sacrifice, have continued to thrive in the border countries, Nepal, Bhutan, and Sikkim. This Nepalese man is called a Jakri. He also lives near Gangtok. I must admit, though, that even some Sikkimese Buddhists do not hesitate before calling him in if a member of their family is ill or endangered. Tibetan Orthodox monks, on the contrary, severely condemn any animal sacrifice. The only sacrifice recognized by the Buddha being the sacrifice of the ego and of the attachment to the world of forms. Personal inner sacrifice, not one of goats or chickens. Oh, so 
सात हाँ भाई हाँ पाँच हाँ बन हाँ बासी हाँ बनस हाँ कन्नी हाँ काली हाँ रोमाई हाँ निर्मल हाँ झाँक हाँ हरी हाँ सलपा When Buddha's religion became Tibet's official religion, the Burns and the sorcerers were ordered to respect certain rules concerning their dress in particular and were limited by certain prohibitions. For example, you can observe that they are obliged to beat the side of the drum that faces away from them as opposed to the rules for official monks. It is said that the sorcerers cover their face with their instrument and hide their shame since their ancestors were defeated by the Buddhists in veritable tournaments of metaphysical discussion and contests in miracles and magic powers. Buddhism was born in India at the foot of the famous Bodhi tree, where 500 years before the birth of Christ, the Buddha Gautama attained awakening illumination, perfection. Twelve centuries later, Buddhism spread to and eventually took over the vast plateaus of Tibet. Budgaya, the one who, for 2,500 years, people have considered to be the savior, the liberator, the conqueror of suffering, meditated here, struggled through the battle against himself, and triumphed. Here, after having found the path of life beyond all births and all deaths, Gautama the Buddha decided to set the wheel of the doctrine into motion and to give man the teaching of the noble truths which embodies the true vision of what is. And also to teach about the path that leads from darkness to light, from illusion to truth, from death to eternity. His message, everything is ephemeral, ceaselessly changing. Joy never exists without suffering, and nothing, nobody, nor you nor I have an identity that is autonomous or permanent. Here, beneath a tree like this one, the noble prince who had given up the throne, his wife, his beloved son, and who had become a monk to free himself and to free other beings from all pain and suffering. Here, Gautama, the Muni, the ascetic from the Sakya family, on the morning that followed a night that will be blessed forever, became Buddha, the enlightened one, the awakened one, the perfect one. Beyond the Dalai Lama's two masters, beyond these two important dignitaries of the Tibetan Buddhist sect of the Yellow Hats, these prosternations and offerings are addressed to the eternal body of the Buddha. They are symbols of the only true offering, that of oneself.
after 2,500 years of fervent faith, will people still prostrate themselves for much longer before the three Buddhist refuges? The Buddha, the Savior, the teaching, the way of right living, and the Sangha, the communion of sages and the faithful. Not far from Budgaya is Vulture's Peak at Rajgir, the important high place for Mahayana Buddhists. For they say that Buddha lived on this mountain for 15 years and gave the teaching that completes that of the Hinayana or small vehicle. This is the foundation of one of the most well-known and important sacred texts of mankind, the Prajnaparamita, the perfection of wisdom, the beyond, beyond wisdom. Here, the Buddha gave the great secret to the world. Everything, all beings, all incidents, everything that happens, whether marvelous or frightful, is as real as a mirage appearing and disappearing on the infinite eternal screen of emptiness, shunyata. For centuries in the past, Hinayana, the Buddhism practiced in Ceylon and Burma, and Mahayana, practiced in Tibet, China, and Japan, turned their backs on each other, criticizing and accusing each other of heresy. Nalanda, where the ruins retain so well the memories of the great era when thousands of monks meditated or studied in its temples and in its cells, Nalanda, the famous university, was the high place of Mahayana, and from here its teachings spread throughout the whole of Tibet. Today, in Asia also, the time is ripe for ecumenism. Buddhists from the north and south, from everywhere, come together in the attempt to understand each other in the name of the guide they all share, the Buddha Gautama, the Lord of Compassion. Buddhism was born in India but completely disappeared after the renaissance of ancient Hinduism. But a few kilometers away from the ruins of Nalanda, at the very place where their Buddhist ancestors walked a thousand years ago, some Indians have built a new university where monks from the world over come to study the ancient holy scriptures. If Pali is the language that was used to write down the Hinayana texts, Sanskrit was used by the Mahayanists, and the works of the Tibetan canon were translated centuries ago from Sanskrit into Tibetan, either by Indians invited to Tibet or by Tibetans who went to India. In Tibet itself, the tradition was then maintained and passed on in several ways. Besides manuscripts, the printers used blocks of carved wood, and many Sanskrit texts that disappeared in India during the Muslim invasions have been conserved in the Tibetan version. Works of art were also a means to convey knowledge. An artist, whether sculptor, engraver or painter, could never have conceived of expressing his own profane aspirations, his dreams, his desires, his fantasies or his torments. As in Egypt, at the time of the pharaohs, and in Europe during the Romanesque or Gothic period, Anonymous art transmitted laws, truths, a complete teaching, and an extremely strict iconography specifies the attributes and the colors of the tantric deities. These symbols of the great forces that drive the universe and give life to every human being. The Tibetan paintings on fabric, despite or perhaps because of the requirements imposed on their painters, are in most cases of great beauty. However, in Tibet, as in India, or with the Muslim Sufis, the essence of the transmission of spiritual influence is the chain of masters and disciples. Outsiders have the habit of calling all monks and Tibetan ascetics Lama, whereas it should apply only to the true gurus, such as Kangyo Rinpoche, qualified to initiate disciples and then to guide them on the path to liberation. There are many different types of master. Each one has attained complete inner freedom which gives him perfect liberty to undertake any task, even that of building a small temple or a stupa, 
as is the case for Chatral Rinpoche. The type of succession which is particular to Tibetan Buddhism is that of these masters, chosen from childhood and called tulkus. This is why, led by Kalu Rinpoche, these monks are performing before this child, Tai Situ Rinpoche, a ceremony that is common to all forms of Buddhism, the ceremony where they confess to the breach of monastic regulations. They do so, absolutely certain that they prostrate themselves before the continuation of a master who appeared for the first time on earth years or centuries ago. The English word reincarnation is a rather unsuitable translation of the Buddhist notion of a predecessor and a successor. Imagine that at the death of St. Bernard of Clairvaux or St. Francis of Assisi, the Cistercian and Franciscan monks searched for and recognized in another human being the qualities that personified the founders of their orders. Thus, the active wisdom of St. Bernard or the infinite compassion of St. Francis would be perpetuated down to the present day through generations of new incarnations. But not all young monks are tulkus, and many Tibetans who were not recognized as a lama at a very young age join monasteries in their childhood. To be frank, some were there just to swell the ranks during the services. Others studied for years the texts, the holy incantations or mantras, the ritual gestures or mudras, and practiced unceasingly self-discipline and meditation. Tibet was not so isolated from the rest of Asia as has often been described. Even though it was surrounded by notorious deserts that were hostile to the caravans and by mountains that were hard to cross. Tibet was particularly influenced by India and China, but in turn influenced its neighboring countries, Mongolia, Ladakh, Bhutan and Sikkim. Sikkim in particular, although today the country is closed for military reasons, has been a meeting place between Western civilization and Tibetan tradition for the last hundred years. Sikkim, under the direction of its king, welcomed the Tibetan orders called Red Hats or non-reformed, whether Nyingmapa or Kakyupa. The invocations that millions of voices and prayer wheels have repeated in Tibet for centuries still resound today around the great stupa of Gangtok. Om Mani Peme Hum. The stupas, called Chirtan in Tibetan, are the most representative monuments of Buddhism as a whole. They are built to shelter relics and their architecture composed of five stories, is a book of metaphysics in itself. The five Dhyani Buddhas, or refractions of the Absolute, the five constituents of the human being, 
the five passions that can be transformed, the five perfections. The whole of Buddhism is symbolized here. Even those who are unable to express the elements of wisdom themselves can feel at the deepest level that life has a meaning, that the absolute is compassion itself. They too take refuge in the promise of ultimate perfection for every being and hail the jewel in the lotus. Om Mani Peme Hum. Near the ancient monastery in Ramtek, 15 kilometers from Gangtok, the disciples and followers of the great master Karmapa are constructing a temple on exactly the same lines as the Tibetan temples. I take the opportunity of these images to pay homage to Sonam Topke Kazi, my collaborator and interpreter. It is a work of faith, for hundreds of people have come down from the mountains to work here, voluntarily. Tibetans, Nepalese, Bhutanese and Sikkimese work fraternally together. In India itself, only one temple has been completed by refugees. The one in Missouri, which was decorated by Tibetan artists. But near Kalimpong, the Sherpas and friends of the famous Sherpa Tenzing, the first man to conquer Everest, did not overestimate their strength or their faith, but rather their material resources. Through lack of financial aid, their temple remains unfinished, like the ruins of their shattered expectations and their unshakable hope. In Tibet, some of the big monasteries housed several thousand monks. They were divided into faculties and generally a medical faculty was included. Among the few who survived from the monasteries, some were able to retreat into India. In Dharamsala, a group of Lama doctors was formed with the intention of maintaining and teaching traditional Tibetan medicine. I have been told that it takes nine years to qualify as a doctor and twelve to become an excellent doctor. Considering that medical studies demand a thorough learning of thousands of pages by heart, it is not too early to start as a child. This medicine is a synthesis of secular Tibetan practice, Chinese acupuncture and Hindu Ayurvedic medicine. Tibetan chemists say that several hundred types of preparations are made up from a thousand botanical species, giving treatment based essentially on plants. As all the plants were not found in their own country, the Tibetans organized important expeditions to neighboring countries, particularly on the Indian slopes of the Himalayas. The Tibetans have no trouble recognizing the success of modern medical science. But a Swiss doctor was so convinced by the value of some of the knowledge acquired by the Lamas that he immediately learnt the Tibetan language to be able to study with his colleagues from Lhasa. There is, of course, a rift between our pharmaceutical specialities, made up to the nearest milligram, and the approximation of Tibetan chemists. But after a year of observation, this Swiss doctor told me that there is no doubt about the recoveries obtained. The Tibetans have extremely precise ideas about which pills, from the hundreds available, to prescribe not only for a particular illness, but especially for a particular patient. For during my conversations with the doctors in Dharamsala, it appeared to me that they concentrated more on treating a human being as a whole than on treating the symptoms of an organic disorder. Apart from a minute examination of the eye, the diagnosis always takes into account the pulse rate, or more precisely, two pulse rates, and observations of the reactions that occur when a urine sample is whisked, in particular, the speed of the appearance and disappearance of the froth that forms upon it. Here, measurements are being taken with a wooden stick, but the aim is not to locate acupuncture points, 
but to specify precisely the symmetries and asymmetries of the patient's body in relation to the proportions of an ideal type. As in European hospitals, the head consultant and his assistant are accompanied by students during consultations. I was not able to check on this, but extraordinary results have been attributed to a Tibetan type of acupuncture, where measurement is also used. If certain university monasteries were able to accommodate as many as 7,000 monks, one should not forget, since the Buddha himself became convinced that women too could be allowed into the community, they have always found in Buddhism the possibility to enter religious life as nuns, to have their heads shaved and to wear monastic robes. Of the tens of thousands of nuns in Tibet, only about a hundred survivors went into India, but they continue to practice yoga and meditation there. The nuns, like the monks, devote their time to the services, rituals, study, reading, prayer and practice of the mudras. These movements involve the entire being and each one has a deep symbolic meaning. The rest of the nuns settled in Dalhousie, on the opposite side of the Himalayan chain. Before celebrating the office of the Buddhist faith, they make a ritual tour of the bungalow, which is both their home and their temple. nuns belong to the Kagyupa order, the order of the yogis. It was founded by the famous ascetic Mapa and, above all, by Milarepa, famous for his works of initiation and sublime poetry. The encounter with the Tibetan world reveals the division of Tantric Buddhism into several orders. The four main orders group almost all the followers, both monks and hermits. The monks here are Nyingmapa. This name means the elders. Their order was the first to be founded in Tibet. Today, in India, their most venerated guru is this man, who, like many Mongols, is beardless and whose long hair is tied back into a bun in the fashion for Tibetan men. He is a sage who is married. He is father of a family. His holiness, Dujom Rinpoche. It is mainly against the Nyingmapa Lamas that some Westerners have made accusations of immorality, witchcraft, perversion of Buddhism and other criticisms. They disappear of their own accord when one spends some time with men of the caliber of Kensei Rinpoche, Kongyo Rinpoche, and Dujom Rinpoche. Here you can see Dujom Rinpoche celebrating a tantric initiation ritual or Abhisheka. The end of this ritual is too sacred 
too secret to be filmed. But even in the initial part of this ritual, we are taken to the very heart of the authentic Tibetan tradition. I would like to remain silent and spare you the commentaries, so that you may, at least as spectators, have the direct experience of this Tibetan tradition. The Sakyapa order, literally the monks from the monastery of Sakya, was historically the second to appear after the Nyingmapa. Their leader today is the Dakti Sakya Lama Trizin Rinpoche. He is quite a young man and he too is beardless and wears his long hair tied back. Despite his youth, Trizin Rinpoche is gifted with some of the parapsychological powers that Westerners have marveled at in certain lamas. These powers are in fact of secondary importance to authentic spiritual life and true wisdom, as the miraculous charisma of certain Christian mystics is to their state of holiness. The Sakyapa is a non-reformed order like the Nyingmapa and the Kagyupa. On the other hand, the Yellow Hats, the Galutpa, who descended from the reform of Tsongkhapa, constitute the official church of Tibet, the one to which the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama belong. Perhaps one could compare the relationship between the Yellow Hats and the Red Hats to the relationship between the Protestants and Catholics as it is today, though a few important differences and memories of past difficulties still prevail there is great mutual respect and a sincere desire for closer connection. On the other hand, the distinction between the three non-reformed orders reminds one rather of the main Catholic orders, Benedictines, Franciscans and Dominicans. Their conviction is of belonging to the same church, but each one is attached to its particular tradition and to its founder. The order of the Kagyupas, in which yoga holds an important place, is itself divided into Dukpa Kagyu and Kama Kagyu. The head of the latter is His Holiness Gyalwa Kamapa. He lives in Sikkim, and he is also a Turku recognized during his early childhood to be the indisputable successor to the first Kamapa. Even though he is only 40, he is perhaps the most famous of the Tibetan pontiffs after the Dalai Lama. Of all the sages 
whether Hindu, Muslim Sufi or Buddhist, he is the most impressive sage with whom I have had the privilege to stay. My own experiences close to him, the radiance of his presence and his silent influence explain the depth of recognition and veneration that are accorded to him. Behind the hieratic mask of self-possession and inner strength, all these Tibetan sages overflow with compassion that is characteristic of Mahayana Buddhists. Their religious life begins with the vow of the Bodhisattva, which is not to dissociate one's own salvation from the liberation of all beings chained to the illusion of birth and death. But the Tibetan church most familiar to foreigners is probably the Yellow Hat, or Gelukpa. Amongst the abbots and the high dignitaries with whom it prides itself, two are particularly respected. The two masters, or tutors, who educated the Dalai Lama. The younger of the two, Kyabje Trijang Rinpoche, is a Lama of exceptional reputation, distinction and intelligence. The way this monk expresses his devotion when consulting him on an important problem concerning his spiritual life is a sign not of civility but of the refined etiquette of these humble Tibetans before the princes of the church. Those who have been a disciple have not only received the most enlightening answers to the most vital questions from their master, but also the transmission of a force an energy which cannot be compared to any other known experience. Only they know that the disciple's fervor is neither fear nor obsequiousness, but love and gratitude. They also know that every gesture that is made in the Master's presence is a ritual. All food taken with the Master is a sacrament. And this silence shared with the Master is a communion with the truth of that which is. The elder of the Dalai Lama's instructors, Kyabje Ling Rinpoche, is the living example of these great Galukpa metaphysicians whose perfect mastery of the Prajnaparamita teachings and various tantras slowly prepared them to reach the highest summit of meditation, meditation without form, non-dualistic, beyond all images and representation. Dharamsala, in the north of the Indian state of Punjab, above the valley of Kangra. This is where the Dalai Lama lives, a monk who is 30 years old. Through his title, the Dalai Lama was already famous a long time before he took refuge in India in 1959. Here he became accessible to admirers, to the curious, to the scholars and the experts. Remote successor of the former Tsongkhapa, recognized as the chief political figure in Tibet by the Mongol emperors, labeled as a living god by journalists the world over, considered to be the reincarnation of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the 14th Dalai Lama, for all the Tibetan refugees, is the living symbol of their lost country and their religion which will never be lost. But this sovereign, for whom their devotion extends to collecting the dust upon which his holy feet tread, this head of state in exile, more famous than many of the prime ministers of powerful countries, is not a king, not an emperor, not a dictator, nor the head of a political party, but a Buddhist monk who submits to all the monastic rules of the sutras, including celibacy and chastity, a monk who prostrates himself with his fellow monks from the Patala in Lhasa and confesses the breach of the rules of his order. Although the Dalai Lama is very learned, as were the 5th and the 13th Dalai Lamas before him, he is not simply a master transmitting initiatic teachings to a handful of disciples. To the Tibetans, 
He is more than this, much more. He is the precious protector of his people, the Buddha of compassion, incarnated on earth to comfort and to serve mankind. After seven months living with the yogis, the monks and the lamas of different Tibetan orders, I am deeply convinced that the Tibetan Tantric Buddhism, as it appears in 1966 in India and in Sikkim, deserves the celebrity it has gained. However, few books, even those written by the most competent specialists, have been able to show why. Because according to the Tibetan masters, the teachings or the transmission of their tantric and yogic knowledge is only conceivable within the relationship between a master and disciple, with all the restrictions that this entails and the whole background of mysticism that is implied. For the Tibetans, the spiritual quest and the ardent desire for personal transformation are the qualities which give the right to receive the highest knowledge. Whereas so-called objective scientific research or intellectual curiosity, even the most respectful, do not. The Tibetan refugee monks have a keen sense of dignity. They loathe begging and they loathe selling themselves or their spiritual heritage. Their mantra, symbolic sounds, and mandala, sacred visual symbols, cannot be handed out indiscriminately, and they won't sell their yogic exercises in the marketplace simply to obtain financial support. It seems that the safeguard of this spiritual heritage is the greatest concern of the Dalai Lama, this exiled sovereign, this monk in prayer.